What's going on guys? My name is Nick. I'm an RV technician. For those of you guys who don't already know me, and today I'm going to be sharing five general tips to understand and live by with your new RV. Whether it be new or used, doesn't matter. These are just kind of five rules to live by and things to understand uh, that are kind of a process or part of owning your RV. Starting off with number one, probably my most important one, the expectation I like to set with people when they're getting new RVs is to understand that this is not a house. Though it may be your home, a lot of you guys are living full time, I get that. I know a lot of my followers are full time livers. I give you guys props. Um, people who've been RVing for a long time definitely understand this. Though it is very much like a house, it has four walls, it has a roof, it has a floor, it has appliances, it's not quite like your home. And that's for a few specific reasons. I'm not gonna get too deep into any of them, but we'll just cover the basics. The first one being your electrical system. Though your electrical system in here is very similar to your home, it's wired with Romex, you have outlets, you, you plug things in just like you normally do. There's a few key differences. One of the main ones being you either have a 30 amp or a 50 amp service, meaning your shore cord that you plug into the pedestal box is either rated at 30 amps or 50 amps, meaning your entire coach is rated at 30 amps or 50 amps. Now, what does that mean? That means that the amount of things that you can plug in and power is limited compared to your home where you may have an 80, 100, 150 amp service and you're not usually too conscious about running multiple things at once. Whereas in an RV, you may not be able to run your air conditioner and your microwave and your electric hot water heater at the same time. Um, you may not be able to run your blow dryer while you're making toast in the kitchen. There's a lot of differences there You'll kind of come to learn most of those. Just be very conscious of what you're plugging in. Also remember that not all the components in here are the same as your home. For instance, the outlets. The outlets in RVs aren't exactly the same as what you're gonna find in your home. So things like space heaters, we've talked about those plenty of times before. Those outlets don't like them. Those heavy amp draw, long-term loads the outlets aren't a fan of them. You're very likely gonna cause some issues melting outlets and things like that. So I definitely don't recommend things like that, like space heaters. Using your griddles and toasters in the kitchens, those are short term. Um, using things like Instapots and things like that, crock pots running all day, you may have some issues with that. So just be cautious, definitely don't leave those things unattended. Um, and don't be surprised if you know, you're trying to run your air conditioner and another thing like a griddle or a coffee pot and you pop some breakers or something like that because again, you are somewhat limited to the amount of power you can consume at one time. That brings me to my next one, which is going to be the plumbing system. Now, while everything seems like it would be just the same, which really it is, the plumbing system in your RV is plumbed very similar, the fixtures are very similar, the plumbing is the same plumbing they use in most modern homes, which is PEX plumbing. Um, all of that is very similar, but there's a few key differences in the plumbing system in your RV. One of those being hot water, especially in the shower. Now, if you have a tanked water heater in your RV, you likely have a six gallon, maybe a 12 gallon, you're not gonna have the same capacity as you would in a house. Where in a house you may have, you know, a 20 gallon, 40 gallon, 60 gallon, even an 80 gallon water heater, you can take back-to-back -back showers, no issues. Now, taking a shower in an RV is not impossible. Taking back-to-back -back showers is not impossible. Just keep in mind, you may not get the same amount of time um, as in a house. You have to be a little more conscious about that. You can upgrade to a tankless water heater. I've got some videos on that as well. Very easy swap, very worthwhile upgrade because then you kind of have hot water on demand as you need it and you have somewhat of what I consider an endless supply. Now, nothing is endless, right? But it's a lot better than your six or 12 gallon tanked water heater. Another thing that your house does not have is tanks. You don't have gray tanks, you don't have black tanks, and you don't really have to worry about what you're putting in the toilet. Now, in an RV, you have to worry about what you're putting down your sink drain because certain types of chemicals, starchy foods, water, especially like pasta water, can cause issues with those said sensors in the tank, so you're gonna get misreadings once those sensors get all gummed up with that stuff. That goes for the old toilet as well. You're gonna to wanna to use your toilet a lot differently. You're gonna make sure you're using the proper amounts of water, be very cautious about what you're flushing down the toilet. Some of that is going to change as well. You wanna be mindful of 
what's going down there, what type of toilet paper you're using, and most importantly, how much water you're using. I have an entire video about proper black tank care and usage if you want to check that out. It's one of my earlier videos. I'll probably eventually redo that now that I've got nicer cameras and things like that. But be mindful of what you're putting down toilets. Be mindful of what you're putting down drains because again, it's not like your house. It doesn't just disappear. It's sitting down below the floor in tanks that are sensitive to things like that, especially the tank sensors. Last quick tip I have as to why this is not quite like your house is again, the construction is a little bit different. Um, it's lightweight materials, they're a lot thinner. You're not always gonna find hardwood and you're definitely not going to find any drywall in here. Now, what does that mean for you? Well, you have to be cautious about what you're screwing into the walls when hanging things. Um, you're gonna find things that are gonna be a little more flimsy in RVs and honestly, there's not really a way around that if we wanna make these lightweight so that you can tow them with your vehicles. Now. The other thing behind that is to remember that this is a house that is essentially going through an earthquake every single time you move it. The chassis is twisting and flexing, you're bumping down the road. Imagine your house going through a small earthquake every day. So yes, you are going to find pieces of trim, fascia, and things like that coming loose from time to time. You're going to find cabinets may get loose and the hinges may get loose. You may have to be tightening things and adjusting things from time to time. These are all things that I would consider completely normal in RV life because again, you have to remember, this is a house going down the road essentially through an earthquake every time you move it. Even things like door adjustments, um, things coming off of rails and stuff like that. There's probably better ways to go about these doors and mounting them and things like that. Again, I don't build them, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just trying to share this information with you guys so that you understand that. Um, same with all of the things in your cabinets and stuff. Make sure they're secured. Remember, this is a house that's moving down the road. We can't just throw plates and, pop, and pots and pans and cups and things in cabinets and expect them to stay in place while we're driving down the road. Again, this tip is kind of generalized. I just want you guys to understand that Though this may be your home, maybe it's your weekend home, maybe it's your lake home. This home is driving down the road, bouncing around. It's built with much different materials. The electrical systems are slightly different. The plumbing systems are slightly different. You're gonna find some key differences there. Um, you're also not gonna be doing routine maintenance on your house as often as you are on here, but that's a whole nother tip that I have down the road in this video. Um, so just keep in mind, it may be your home, but it's not quite like your house. Tip number two, going back to the maintenance we just talked about, um, you wanna have a regular maintenance schedule. You want to stick to that maintenance schedule. You wanna have that written down so you don't forget those things. Um, you you wanna keep track of the maintenance that's being done and you wanna make sure all your routine maintenance is being done. Uh, for instance, bearing packs. You should be doing bearing packs every 10 to 12,000 miles or every year, whichever one comes first. Um, those are maintenance things that you don't want to skip on. That routine maintenance and upkeep on your RV is what's going to stop it from falling apart long before it's supposed to and stop you from making expensive repairs before you have to. Maintenance schedules are gonna vary between most RVs, but you need to build your own maintenance list of things that you know need to be done to your specific coach. Some of the ones that kind of apply to all of them, especially travel trailers, fifth wheels, is going to be bearing packs again. You're gonna have sanitizing your fresh water system, which you should be doing yearly or bi-yearly, making sure your tanks are clean, making sure your plumbing system is clean, because again, there's, there's water being drained out of it and put back in it. On the note of draining, when you're not using the camper or RV, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your tanks are empty, you're taking all that fresh water out and your lines are empty so that that water doesn't become stagnant in there. Checking your roof seals, exterior seals, sweep seals on the slides, uh, compartment seals, things like that, door seals, window seals. You're gonna wanna keep an eye on those things because that routine maintenance, again, is gonna stop you from getting water damage or having other expensive issues with the RV that you don't wanna have to take care of. Most repairs or incidents with RVs can be prevented with keeping a solid maintenance schedule. Some of that maintenance is kinda like your home. You know, for instance, cleaning out your AC filters, making sure that's free flowing and the air is moving through there like it should and doesn't have blocked up filters. 
Some of the other things, on the other hand, are going to be very new to you. Again, like bearing packs and checking roof seals. I don't know when the last time you got on your roof of your house to check your seals was, but probably not as often as you're going to be doing in your RV to make sure that your roof stays in one piece, your wall stays in one piece, and of course the RV in general stays in one piece because water and RVs do not mix very well. So outside of the maintenance schedule, you're going to have another list that you're going to want to keep and that's tip number three and that is going to be a pre and post trip list a list of definitive things you need to do before moving this thing before moving slides in and out and things like that why is this important because without a list like that for instance on that list you can have check for obstructions in the slides before you open or close them when you're traveling you may have a broom or something that falls behind this slide fascia and now if you go to open the room you're going to rip this slide out so checking behind uh, slide rooms to make sure there's no obstructions. Before you leave, making sure that your leveling jacks are up so you don't destroy those on the way out. Making sure your tongue jack is up. Making sure all your marker lights work. Make sure your brakes work. Having a definitive list of things that you should do before this thing moves is going to prevent you from having catastrophic issues. Now on that list, I would also recommend adding checking the roof out if you're comfortable with getting on your roof. Why? Because backing into that campsite, you may have dragged a branch across that roof membrane. I've seen it way too many times. And by the time you find that tear, it's usually because you have a wet spot in the roof. So if you add that to your list as well, you can prevent that. There's a lot of things you can add to that list and they're gonna be very specific to the coach that you're in. But having that pre-trip list or post-trip list is going to save you from lots of headache and potential damage or headaches going down the road. Um, and just keep you safer. Like I said, checking your marker lights and your brakes on your trailer. Those are things you're going to want to do before you leave and before it's too late. Um, not so much the ticket you're going to get from the Department of Transportation for not having lights on your trailer, but the safety issue you're causing on the highway. So having all of those things checked off, having a system. I've seen all different types of systems and customer RVs. I've seen everything from popsicle sticks and cups that you got to go through to make sure you do it. You can have it on paper. You can do it however you'd like. Either way, just make sure that you have a list and you're sticking to it. Don't ever rush out of the campground. Don't ever rush to try and get this thing open. Try and take your time because simple little things, again, like missing something stuck in a slide room is going to end up costing you a bunch of money when you rip the face off that slide room and you can actually cause damage to the slide mechanism doing the same thing. That same list is where you're going to want to put things like draining your tanks and draining your water heater and things like that. So make sure that you get that list together. Again, it's going to be kind of individual to you and your coach, but just make sure your first few trips out, you start kind of building that list so that you don't forget those things and you cause yourself a lot less headache. Number four is going to go with those last two. And number four is going to be keep a log book. I know a lot of you guys probably got something that looks a little bit like this with your RV and it has all your manuals and information about your RV, but I want you to keep a log book. Log your service, log your miles, that's going to help you with your bearing packs. Um, log everything that you do with the coach and also keep information in there that's important to you. For instance, do you know where the controller is for your slide room in the case that you have to manually override it? Once you know where it's at, you can keep it there. You can keep the location of your water pump, service records, things like that. Those service records are gonna be important in there because when you have to stop at a dealer in a different state from where you bought and maybe you've already had some work done in the slide room, that information is gonna help the tech who's working on it this time to see what may or may not have already been done so they know where to go from there. Um, if you're in a drivable unit, that's keeping track of your oil changes and stuff as well. There's lots of things you can document. Essentially, that logbook should be everything you ever do to your RV, the miles you put on it, um, any service you do to it, any issues you've had, anything like that. You're going to want to keep that stuff in a logbook. It's going to help you in the long run, I promise. I can't tell you how many times that has come in handy for me as a tech that the customer has had information saved from previous records so that I'm not wasting my time chasing an issue that's already been resolved and we can move on to the next possible scenario. So a logbook, you can keep your maintenance records in there, keep your service records in there, you can keep your pre-trip or post-trip list in there. Just have a general book, binder, something like that where you're keeping all that information about your RV. And the very last tip I have is going to sound kind of silly to you guys, and that tip is do not get all your information from a single source. 
Don't get all your information from a single YouTuber. Don't get all your information from a single forum. Do your research and be very careful of the information you find on the internet. The entire reason I started my channel is because of the amount of misinformation I found out there and I wanted to make sure some of the correct information was getting out there. Now I'm humble enough to know that I'm not always correct, so I encourage you to double check my information as well. Always get the right information. Not just because people are wrong, but because that information may not apply to you. Where one person may tell you how to maintain or lubricate a slide room, that information may not apply to you. For instance, this slide room is very easy to lubricate, but if you have a Schwintex slide room, you shouldn't be lubricating. So if someone tells you to use a specific lube on your slide room, you may not have that same type of slide room. If someone gives you a tip about a water heater, that may not be the same water heater that you have. There's a lot of different variables and there's also a lot of misinformation. So just be very careful about where you're getting information from, double check it, careful what you read in the forums and Facebook groups and things like that because I see tons of uh, hacks or DIY ideas that are absolutely terrible. Um, I'm not going to get into specifics on a bunch of those, but mainly just remember that one, the information may be wrong, and two, the information just may not apply to you or your RV or the specific systems you have in your RV. And the next and last best tip that I have for you guys is if you want to see more tips, tricks, and tours and RVs like this one, make sure you guys press that subscribe button.